Okay, so we've in our previous video we showed how to do uh, static NAT and go back and reference that video. In that video, uh, we will break down how this um, how the network is set up and uh, we'll go through a static NAT configuration that allows us to have devices from outside our network access devices with private IP addresses inside our network. All right, and remember, if you want to follow along with this, the um, the packet tracer file available for download is linked in the um, in the description below. Okay, so static NAT works great to give access from the outside to the inside. It doesn't work so well to give access from the inside to the outside. The problem with that is it's a one-to-one -one permanent translation. So what happens is when we put it in place, it's always, always there. So that address will always be associated with that outside address will always be associated with this inside address. Well, it doesn't really work for client PCs that need access to the outside. If I had to do that for every single one, A, it would be tedious, time-consuming, and error-prone. B, I would, wouldn't actually be saving IP addresses. Right? I'd be using one outside address for every device inside my network that needed internet connection. That's going to be a problem. So what I need to do is I need a way of having more than one device use an IP address. All right, there are a couple of different ways to do this. Uh, I'm going to start, this video will demonstrate how to do this with a NAT pool. Let me warn you ahead of time, this is not my favorite approach. So static NAT is a one-to-one -one permanent translation. Uh, the outside address is always associated with the inside address. A NAT pool is a one-to-one -one dynamic translation. So what we do is we have a pool of addresses, outside addresses that are available in this range right here, that we can use. And whenever a device inside our network wants to get out to the internet, it will use one of those addresses. Now, we'll only use it temporarily. When it's done, um, the router, after it's been in use for a while, the router is going to drop that translation, and that address becomes available for the next device to use it. However, we're still kind of limited. Let me show you what I mean by that. Actually, let's back up real quick. Remember, in our previous video, we said that this, like most ISP routers, has a firewall that blocks, blocks traffic from a private uh, network. To the internet. So if I go to my PC just to show you that this isn't working, or you know, is working depending on your point of view, I am going to browse to 65.103.154.112, which should be this server. And notice I can't get there, I don't have access, and it's because, hey, go a couple of more times just to prove it. And it's because I've got that firewall or that access control list that's blocking anything from my private address. In order to get out, I'm going to have to be translated. All right, so we've already done some of our basic configuration when we did our static net. And what I mean by that is if we do a show run, you're going to see, let me get down to my interfaces here, you're going to see we've already identified the inside and the outside interface. Now you have to do that whether, no matter what type of NAT you're using for IPv4. So if you're doing static NAT, dynamic NAT, NAT overload, or port address translation, all of these things require that you identify an inside and an outside interface. Now for a pool to work, we have to do two things. Number one, we have to create the pool. So it's IP NAT pool and then we're going to give it, well, we're going to go to config mode first, IP NAT pool, and then we need to give it a name, and I'm going to call it access, IP NAT pool access, and we're going to identify the starting IP address. Now, these are going to be addresses, to use for the pool, they have to be addresses that I actually have available, which means my ISP has to be forwarding them to me, and you'll see right here we have that 209.165.184 uh, network. And it's a slash 29, which means I have my addresses are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 0 and 7 are used. 0 for the network ID, 7 for the broadcast. That leaves me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1 is used by my ISP router. 2 is used by uh, my local router for this ISP connection. That leaves me 3, 4, 5, 6. 3 is used for this, which only leaves me 4, 5, and 6 that I can use. So... I'm going to start with 4. Um, 
So my starting address is going to be 209.165.184.4. And then I'm going to set my ending address, which is going to be 209.165.184.6. And then it's going to ask me to specify the word net mask, one word, net mask. And then it's going to ask me to specify the uh, network mask for these addresses. And that's going to be my 255.255.255.248. It's going to be the network mask that I use for those. Okay, that creates my pool. So the pool is addresses that I'm going to translate used to translate to. Now I also need to identify the devices that are going to be allowed to translate that, uh, to go through the network address translation table and be translated. And I'm going to do that with an access list. So I'm going to create an access list. And it can, it's going to be a standard access list because all I'm doing is identifying the source address. It can be either named or numbered. I'm going to do it numbered. Access list 1 permit, and I'm going to specify my entire network, 192.168.1.0 with a wildcard mask of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.255 because this is a slash 24 network. All right, so I've identified my inside and my outside interfaces. I've created my pool. I've created my access list. Now I need to marry my pool and my access list. And the way I'm going to do that is with the IPNAT command. Now, again, this is an inside translation. Like I said, we'll almost always use inside, so it's IPNAT inside source. But this time, I'm not doing static. So when I did static NAT, remember, it was a one-to-one -one permanent translation. I did IPNAT inside source static. But now I'm not doing this. I want to choose devices that are allowed to translate. And I'm going to do it from a list. And then I'm going to specify my access list. So IPNAT inside source list one, so that group of addresses, I want it to use a pool, and then I want to specify the name of my pool. So that's what this looks like. IPNAT inside source list one pool access. All right. I'm going to exit out and show IPNAT trans. Now, when we did the static translation, that popped up immediately. But when we do a dynamic translation using a pool, that doesn't pop up immediately. It does. We don't have anything translate here until we actually try to use it. So let's minimize this and let's go back to our PC. And from our PC, we're going to access, open up my web browser, 65.103.154.1.0. Which is this uh, web server right here on Erner, the same one we couldn't get to before. And go. And there is my internet server, and it came up perfectly. Remember, I couldn't get to it before because of the access list was blocking my access because it was a private address trying to go to a public address space. Now it works just fine because my translation is working. Let's go back to our router and see what this looks like now. So I'm going to pull up my router, and we're going to reissue the command show IP NAT trans. And here we see 192.168.1.29 is translated to 209.165.184.4. Now, the drawback of this is that um, I only have 4, 5, and 6 available. So the next device it tries to connect is going to get 209.165.184.5. The next one is going to get 209.165.184.6. The fourth one that tries to access it is not going to be allowed access because it doesn't have a available address. That's the drawback of doing pools. Now, or doing one-to-one -one translation for pools. There is another option, and that is to use something that Cisco calls port address translation. I've also heard, and I tend to refer to it as NAT overload. And that solves that issue, and that's going to be the subject of our next video.